Hello, everyone. Sorry for the slightly late start. We will, uh, well, we sort of started in an initially suspended state, but um, I'll, I'll save the jokes for later. Welcome to C++ Coroutines from Scratch. I am Phil Nash. Um, work at uh, Sonar. You can see I'm wearing a Solar Lint T-shirt today. Uh, some developer advocate there. We do uh, static analysis tools. It's not what we're going to be talking about today, but I need to mention that at the start. Um, do catch me afterwards if you do want to talk more about that, of course. Um, we're going to be talking about coroutines, of course. Before we get to that, I want to ask you a few questions. First of all, uh, who here is an expert at C++ coroutines? I'm not seeing any hands. OK. Uh, that's not surprising. Um, all right, let, let's make it a little bit easier. Who here um, feels like they, they're comfortable with C++ coroutines? They could probably use it in a project if they haven't done it already. Half, uh, two halves of a hand. That's, that's one on average, I think. OK. Um, what about this one, then? Who here has been to another talk on coroutines in C++ or read an article and still doesn't quite get it? Oh. <laughs> I said it's about half the room. Yeah, that, that's, that's um, more in line with expectations. Um, why is that? Why is it that we need to go to multiple talks or read multiple articles b before we get it? Because they're not actually that complicated. But there are a lot of moving parts. And th there's another problem with the way we usually teach a com complex subject. Uh, and, and the right way to do it, which, spoiler, is not the way I'm going to do it today, <laughs> The right way to do it is to say, well, the, the subject itself is fairly complex, so I'm going to present the simplest possible example. So you're not going to be distracted by the other details. And, and so that, that's exactly the right way to do it. That's the way most other uh, talks and articles will do it. Uh, one of the problems with that, well, the trade-off, let's say a trade-off with that, is first of all, you can go away thinking, well, yeah, but, but how does that apply to a real-world problem? And maybe the more serious problem with that is you can go away thinking that was a really complex solution to a really simple problem, which you know, is not quite so satisfying or motivating. So this is going to be a little bit of an experiment. And I should say, I've done this talk, or a talk with this title twice before now. It's my third run at it. Um, and I said every time, this is an experiment. This is the third iteration of the experiment. I've slightly adjusted it. Uh, and the experiment is I'm going to present a more complex problem uh, to start with, a more complex example. Uh, and there's obviously risks with that. There's a risk I'm going to lose you before I get to actually presenting the material. Um, and there's a risk you'll just be overwhelmed with those details. Uh, it's also going to take about probably about half the talk to, before we actually get to coroutines, because I'm going to build up to it. But if it does work, the payoff is you will have more of a, an appreciation of how coroutines can work in the real world and, and see a problem where there's a good complexity match. And you can say, yeah, coroutines did actually help me there. So that's what we're aiming for, and hopefully we will achieve it. Because this is the third time I've done it, I've got some feedback from previous runs, and I will say they've been a bit mixed, which was sort of expected, and quite a few people have actually uh, found that it's been very valuable. So hopefully you'll be one of them this time around. OK, what's the problem that we're going to be looking at then that is more complex? Well, first of all, who is in the room for the talk before this? There's, there's more, more hands going up. Um, so it's about a quarter of you. Uh, that was on low latency uh, software for trading. This is also going to be coming from a, uh, a finance perspective. It's actually, that's just the context. You don't need to understand any of that. And it's going to be about performance but definitely not in the same sort of category as the previous talk, not low latency. Uh, you'll see what I mean by that as we get to it. But uh, from my experience uh, years ago working at a bank um, on a quant system, and we had to deal with uh, lots of objects like this. It's just a, a sampling of, of some names that I got from uh, Quantlib, an open source quant library. Uh, and of these, I, I picked a few that we're going to be dealing with today. And so you don't need to know what any of these mean or do. Uh, they're just there to sort of give more of a real-world flavor to, to flesh it out a bit. Um, now, I've sort of created my own version of, like, mini version of this, this library. And it's got types like this. Um, 
This is one of the simpler ones. Um, looks like there's a lot there, but these are all just simple value types. So even though we might have, say, calendar and some vectors, that they're just value types. Now, the, what they're going to be doing is loading this data in. So how we deserialize this is important. How we deserialize individual values, we're not worried about that today. That's an, another talk. So this is a nice, simple one. Uh, another thing to bear in mind, because you'll see this a lot, um, a lot of quant libraries have these singly rooted OO hierarchies. Um, it's been a few years since I've been in that game. Maybe there's some more modern takes on it now. I hope so. But uh, certainly this was very prevalent in my day. So our one derives from this F object. It does actually make things a bit simpler in our case. This was a slightly more complex object uh, forward. Uh, in particular, the last two fields there. Uh, you can see they're both shared pointers to something called a curve. So these are dependencies. What we're going to be doing is actually building up an object graph of, of interconnected objects. That's why we have uh, shared pointers. Um, so we're going to have to load those separately. And also, that curve type, oh, there we go, uh, itself, of course, derived from F object. But it itself is the base of a, a, another branch in this hierarchy, so like a little family of, of curves there. Which means, in, in our case, where we just have share pointers to curves, well, we don't know what the concrete types are either. That also has to be determined at load time. Um, another detail, which uh, for this iteration I've tried to smooth out a bit more, it was a bit distracting, was that um, one of the types we're going to look at, fixed rate bond forward, derives from forward. Um, so it really just extends that type. In the code, we, we don't really talk about that distinction anymore. Now, we're going to be getting some JSON in. Uh, let's say the actual representation doesn't really matter. It's incidental. Uh, but it look, looks something like this for one of those um, fixed rate bond forward objects. You can see we've got actually three dependencies in there. And they have this little notation, um, like a string name with a type slash some ID. We, we call all of these IDs. So we're going to have some mechanism to go away and find out what that is. Now, if we do go away and load one of these curves here, what we'll actually get back is just a tiny bit of JSON that just has a field that says instance that tells you what we should actually load. So we need to do two hops for those. So a little bit more to it. So if we go away and load that one, then we'll get, in this case, a fitted bond discount curve uh, specifically. As I say, it doesn't matter what these actually do. I've also stripped out all of the functionality. We're just purely loading data here or data objects. OK, so that's the context. What we want to do in our particular problem is load these two objects. Oh, and by the way, I've just put a load of JSON files in the file system to, to represent some sort of data store that might really be a database or even a live feed. So we want to load these two objects, fixed rate bond forward one, fixed rate bond forward two. Now, in doing so, because of their dependencies, in some cases, dependencies are dependencies, we're going to end up with this object graph. So there's 10 objects here that ultimately we need to load in as a result of just trying to load those two. And that, that's really the, the problem that we're trying to solve. So even if you've not worked in finance, you probably recognize at least parts of this problem come up again and again. It's fairly, fairly common. Uh, or oh, one other thing to say here, you see the dotted lines around the curves? It's because those objects don't actually um, end up in the final object graph. They're just sort of intermediate as we're loading it. So we're going to have a stab at, at doing this. First of all, find the right sort, uh, project, this one. Now to switch mirroring. OK. Uh, what's that font size like at the back? Is it readable? I need to go up a bit. I'm getting sort of half hands, OK. Um, I, I did create a shortcut to increase the font size. Can't remember what it is now. It wasn't that. <laughs> okay. All right. Ho hopefully you can follow this. Um, right. This is our main. This main is going to be the same in all of the examples I'm going to show. So I'll just walk you through it once. Uh, the meat of it is this line here. This is actually doing the load and build of objects. The reason we say load and build is loading is just loading the JSON in from the file. Build is actually creating an object in memory, um, setting any fields, and then doing any further 
computation on, on that, um, as you might do in, in the real world. So you can see we've got our two IDs there, the fixed rate one forwards one and two. And we get them back as a presumably a vector. Now we've got these timers before and after, which we get the difference of just so we can see how long that took. And, and we print that out to this, to this log. Now we're doing this in milliseconds. And again, if you were in the room before, <laughs> you'll think, milliseconds, that's not going to be accurate enough. But it turns out it is, and, and for reasons that we'll come on to in a moment. That's fine. And the last little block of code at the end there, the last three lines, all that's doing is it's just like a little smoke test. It's not an exhaustive test or anything, but just tries to probe in and get one of the, the values on one of the, the leaf objects at the end just to check that we're actually loading what we thought we were loading. So we, we know that all the objects, first level objects, are fixed rate bond forward, so we cast them up here. Um, we get a discount curve out there, which we happen to know is a fitted bond discount curve. And then we can finally check this value at the end. So let's say we're going to do the same main for all of our examples for comparison. Let's have a look then at the more interesting part. Um, or in fact, I, I skipped over one part, which is we've got this repo object here. Let's have a look at there first. Not much to it, uh, as well as our load and build objects and a little load helper. We have this unordered map, strings to f object pointers, it's just a shared pointer to f object, and that's our cache. So anytime we load anything, we put it in the cache, and we can look it up by name. Simple as that. We're going to populate that. So if we're now looking load and build objects that does the work, we've got our uh, initializer list of IDs coming in. We know up front how many objects we want, so we can reserve those. Iterate through our IDs. Look it up in the cache, because we've already loaded it. It's going to be there. Uh, and if it, if it is there, we just put that straight into our output object, object vector. And if not, we call load to actually load it, and that will also cache it, and, and push that back. Instead, return it at the end. Simple enough so far. So that load helper, which is at the top here, that actually forwards on to deserialize to do the actual work of, of loading and building. Uh, and then with the return object, just puts that in the cache. So let's look into deserialize. It's really starts to get a little bit more interesting, a little bit more messy as well. The first line, we are just creating our deserializer. Uh, just got a simple wrapper around the n Loman uh, JSON um, library. Doesn't matter, it's incidental to this. We could be loading from XML or um, protobuf or something, doesn't matter. First thing we do is find out what the type of the object is. That's one of the fields. Well, we're getting it as a string here. And now this is the bit that you might have some concerns with. <laughs> uh, we're just doing a series of cascading ifs to see if it's this type, we'll create it this way, and so on, based on the string. Obviously, in a real-world project, you would have some sort of map with some um, factory functions. Um, yes, we, we can do all of that. At this scale, this is going to be fine for now. So for each one of these strings, there will be a corresponding specialization of this build template. So if we have a look in the one for fitted bond discount curve, if you remember from the JSON earlier, this was the, uh, the simple one, just value types, just a leaf type. So we create one, and then we use the deserializer to set all the fields. Uh, and that's it. We return the object, nice and simple. If I go up a bit, you can see that I haven't implemented all of them. The one for fixed rate bond forward, this is the one that had the three dependencies. And so it's a little bit more complex. We first need to load the dependencies. So you can see we actually call right back to the repo and call load and build objects again. So quite heavy recursion here. But that will transitively load the three dependencies. We've then got that in a vector. And we can use that to populate our fields. So a little bit more to it. Still fairly straightforward, I think. Um, but we've got a couple of big problems here. One is this. Uh, very tight coupling now between the, uh, the, the repo that's doing the load and build objects and the serializer that really should just be serializing field, deserializing fields. Uh, but we've got this, this tight coupling here. 
And the other thing is we've got this um, deeply ingrained uh, depth first algorithm for how we transitively load everything in. And as you can see, that's going to cause us some problems. Uh, one other thing to show you here is that curve is a special case. Because if you remember, we've got to load that extra file first to find out what the actual type is. So we just do that in one extra hop here. And again, recursively call back to the deserialize method. So this is our first naive stab at the problem. Uh, hopefully, you followed all of that. Let's run it and see what happens. Completed on 122 milliseconds. So I told you milliseconds was enough. Run it a few more times. It's hovering around 123. Why is it taking so long? Oh, by the way, this is, this is the release build. I meant to start with a debug build. It's about the same. It does make a difference. And the reason is that I didn't show you. It's a bit that actually loads from JSON. I sneaked in this extra sleep for 10 milliseconds. And the reason I did that, as the comment says, if you can read that, usually we would, well, in a real world project, we would probably be loading this over a network, something with a bit higher latency. Um, and that, that's really what we're measuring here, is the latency of these round trips to some remote data store. OK, so there were 10 objects to load. Each of them takes an additional 10 milliseconds round trip. That's most of, most of what we're measuring here. But now let's go back to the slides for a moment. We were looking at this object graph. Now, we know that the first two objects that we wanted to load, the ones in the middle, we went out those, those two are up front. We could load those in one round trip. And then we can ask each one of those, or both of those, what their dependencies are, and collect that list before we go off to do a second round trip. So we're going to batch our loads. And then with that, I think, five uh, second level dependencies, or first level dependencies, we can ask it for its dependencies, and we get the, the final three. And we end up with something more like this, if we batch them up. So we've reduced 10 round trips down to three, which in this particular example, and it's not always going to work out quite so nicely, in this particular example should give us a really significant performance improvement. So let's have a stab at changing our example to something like this. So. OK, I think this is the one, yeah. So main, as I say, is exactly the same. So let's go into load and build objects. Um, and this, you can see, there's a lot more to it now. In fact, I should start by looking at the repo. So we've got the cache as before, but we've also got this additional vector to load. And this is the thing that's going to collect the, all the IDs for batching. So initially, we'll populate that with our initial list. Then as we go, Collecting the second level dependencies, we'll put those in there. Let's have a look at how that works. So right up front, we're going to need to populate the to load vector with the IDs coming in. That's all that's doing. And then we're going to go into this loop where all the time there are more things to load, we're going to, we're going to keep looping. Okay. And instead of deserialize, we're going to have deserialize all. So it's now a batch loader. We'll look at that in a moment. And what it gives you back are not the objects, but these things that I'm calling build tasks. Because if the object can't be fully deserialized because it's waiting dependencies, it's in this partially built state. And so the build task sort of represents that partially built state and the set of dependencies that it's waiting for so that we can match them all up later. But having done so, we can clear out a load vector ready for the next round, go through our build tasks, and try to resolve them. Any, any dependencies there? We'll, we'll look at that in a second. If it can't resolve them at this point, because the dependencies haven't been loaded yet, then it puts it into this incomplete tasks vector. So we can come back to them later. And it will keep doing that, as I say, until we run out of objects to load. So let's have a look, first of all, at deserialize all. 
So this, there's a little bit more to it now, but you can see right up front, this is now where we're doing our 10 milliseconds sleep. We're doing it for the whole batch. That's what we, we wanted. And instead of creating an object, we're creating a vector of build tasks. And for each of the IDs, as before, we create our deserializer. Um, but then we call build object, which gives us a task. And that's what we put in our vector and return. So let's have a look in build object. This looks now very similar to deserialize before, except that we return this build task instead, but it's got the same type switch, so I won't go into that again, except just to note that curve is now not treated differently, at least at this level. Uh, we have a, a build curve, and we'll see why in a moment. So let's have a look at, first of all, that simple one, fitted bond discount curve. This looks almost identical to before, no real changes there other than the fact that we return the build task. Now, in this case, we actually have the object. We return that at the end. So build task has an overloaded constructor that takes the object and says, OK, no dependencies. Nice and simple. So let's have a look at the more complex one, the one that actually has dependencies. Now we're doing quite a bit more. So we have this dependencies object that we create, give it the deserializer. And for each of our dependencies, we express it as a requirement. Dot require the, the field that needs to be populated. So it's actually going to take a reference to, to the field. And the, the name of the field in the serialized version. And if we have a quick look in require, you can see it doesn't matter too much, but what we're doing internally is just uh, creating this lambda that captures the operation of once you've got the dependency, actually writing it into the field that we, we passed in. Um, and also, and then adds it into this unmet dependencies structure. So the details don't matter too much. But that's what we're doing. That's how we're capturing our dependencies up front. And then, so we're returning a build task. Now we actually create one. And we call on it, continue with dependencies, and pass it this lambda. So this lambda is, a, is what we call a continuation. It's like the logical continuation of the same function. We're saying, well, once we've got those dependencies, call me back on this lambda, you know, traditional callback, and we'll continue this, this building of the object. So that there may be more going on here. We don't have it here. Because it is the logical continuation of this function, we're having to move our current state, which at the moment is just the object that we're building, into the lambda so that we can continue it. We also pass it the dependencies object so that we can wait for the dependencies to be resolved. And we return the build task. So later, when that task has been resolved, we're going to get called back here and produce an object. Okay. Hopefully this is making sense so far. So it's not terribly complicated, but there's just a lot of bits of code to try to hold in your head at once. Um, and the curve, similar in a way, but this might jump out at you. <laughs> Make shared of a shared pointer. <laughs> a shared pointer to a shared pointer. If that doesn't set off alarm bells, I don't know what does. But the reason we're doing that is if you remember, because this is going to be a dependency, and we need to pass a reference to the, the field that holds the dependency. So we need some stable block of memory that that's going to be in. So we're going to create it here and put it in a shared pointer. Now, we could have used a unique pointer. And I was trying to do that just before <laughs> coming here today. Um, hit some problem. I, I gave up and reverted back to the shared pointer. But uh, it shouldn't necessarily be a shared pointer. But it's the level of indirection that's important here. Um, then we create our dependencies object require the instance field, and we say we're going to write into our outer shared pointer. And then the same, create the build task, continue with dependencies, we pass the curve holder in, and once that's been set, we can dereference the outer shared pointer to get the inner one and, and return that. So a little bit more convoluted, but it's uniform with the, with the rest of it now. If that didn't make sense, don't worry too much. 
OK, so that's how we are now building the objects in this batched world. Let's go back to our top level loop. So we deserialized all of our objects into build tasks. Many of them will be incomplete. Uh, we try to resolve the ones that we can. So let's now have a look at how we do that. So give it a build task. We'll go through its dependencies. Each dependency will say whether it's already been met, if it's already been set before. So we only do this for new ones. Uh, and if not, we will call require object, which is the same thing we, we recalled at the, um, the very start, just to look up objects in the cache or put them on the to load vector. And if we did look it up in the cache, we can supply that immediately. And that's going to call that setter lambda. Otherwise, we just record the fact that yeah, we've still got, we're still waiting for something. And if we are, uh, sorry, if we're not, then we can resume the task. That's going to then call back our continuation lambda that we saw in the builder. And assuming that returns a valid object, then we can put that in the cache, and we're good. So that's how we resolve dependencies. So if I go back. So we did that here as we got the object. But after we've loaded all the objects that we can, there are still going to be some tasks in the incomplete tasks vector that now, hopefully, the, the dependencies should have been loaded for. So we will reverse through that, so from the uh, least dependent to most dependent, and call resolve dependencies for those. After that, we should now have loaded and built all of our objects. So we can, well, they'll, they'll all be in the cache here. So we put them into our output vector and return it. So I'm tempted to say, and that's it. It's obviously a lot more complicated than the original example. Was it worth it? Well, let's run it and see. I'll run it a couple of times. So it's coming in at about 38 milliseconds now. Before, it was 120 something, wasn't it? So we've definitely seen pretty much the expected speed up through reducing that round trip latency. That's what we wanted. Very likely, that's going to be worth it for you if you're in this situation. Pay a bit of extra complexity cost. And I'm not saying this is the only way you could do it. Uh, maybe there's something else that makes more sense for you. But it's the sort of thing we're going to have to do. Now, this is obviously still not using coroutines. And I wouldn't be presenting this if there wasn't a coroutines solution for it. So let's finally get to talk about coroutines. And we are exactly half an hour in, so I said we're <laughs> I spent about half, half the talk, didn't I? All right, let's go back to the slides. Uh, oh. There we go. So this is what we've done now. We, we batched up our loads, but basically using the same, same code. Let's talk about coroutines. So a bit of a, an abstract break. Let's, um, before we dive into the code again, because when people first hear about coroutines, the uh, first reaction is to be overwhelmed by all the moving parts. You've got to try and hold in your head while you're trying to work out what, what works with what. I can't guarantee to get ahead of that, but I'll, I'll do my best. So you can see I'll split this up into user provided on the left hand side, the things that we have to write, and then standard library or compiler provided on the, on the other side. There's some bits across the two. We'll see what that means in a moment. <clears throat> so we'll start with the task or generator type. We've already seen build task in our batch example. It's serving the same, same sort of role. That is effectively a, a coroutine task, just not using coroutine's syntax yet. But it's serving the same role. It's task slash generator, because a, a special case of this sort of coroutine object um, is a generator. We'll, we'll talk about that a little bit later. But we've been talking about tasks so far. Now, you can think of this type 
as being like a, a remote control for your co-routing. So you've got a co-routing going on over here, There's some way to control it, and this is the interface that you're gonna give users of your co-routing how to control it. Resuming it, seeing whether it still needs to carry on, getting any state that it's collected along the way. That all happens here, and you get to control that. So this is an interface for your, your users, which may be you, of course. And we'll see how this all hangs together when we get to the code, but that's its role. Now, above that, we have the promise type. Very misleading name. It's nothing to do with futures and promises. Well, there's a very slight overlap, but not, not worth mentioning. This is really a, a place that you put in a sort of common state. We'll talk about that in a moment. But in terms of the, its interface, it's, if the task type is the interface for your users, the promise type is interface for the compiler or the, the coroutine infrastructure. It's what gets called by the, the magic of coroutines. So you're going to be writing some stuff to satisfy the compiler. It's actually, there's not many places in C++ that that happens. We've got things like uh, main. The infrastructure calls main. Nobody ever calls that. But there's a couple other places. And then suddenly, the promise type comes along, and it's got about six or seven methods <laughs> that get called. So that can take it by surprise as well. Um, they're a lot simpler than they look at first sight. But we'll get to that. Um, now, we have this thing called the coroutine frame. You can see that dotted line uh, or the box at the top. It's sort of creeping into the user-provided side, but you never actually see the coroutine frame in the same way that you don't see a stack frame. It's, sort of, it's provided for you. You have stuff in it, but you never actually get to say, well, what's further up the stack? Well, not within defined behavior anyway. And it's similar here. And it's playing, in some ways, it's playing much the same role. So all your local variables in your coroutine will be in the, in the coroutine frame. But also the promise type, the instance of the promise type is in the coroutine frame. And that's actually really significant because it means anything you put in the promise type is going to, be, is going to persist for the, the lifetime of the coroutine. This is quite, quite useful information. Um, there may be some other bits and pieces in there as well for the running of the coroutine. <clears throat> now, I said that you don't get to interact with it directly. What you do get is this coroutine handle. So one of the small number of library types that we do get is the coroutine handle, and that wraps the magic for interacting with the coroutine itself. So you've got a few things on there, like res resume is on there, destroy, um, and a couple of other convenience methods that we'll, we'll run into. There's not that much to it. And importantly, the coroutine handle doesn't have ownership. That, that puts that responsibility onto you. So it has destroy, but you've got to call it explicitly. That, that's really important. So typically, not always, but typically, your t it's your task object or generator that has a copy of a, a coroutine handle that does the lifetime management. It doesn't have to be that way. In our example, it is going to be, and it usually is. So we need to take that in, into consideration. Another bit that's a little bit subtle is because the promise type lives in the coroutine frame, access to the promise type instance is via the coroutine handle. And the reason it's a bit subtle is because usually it's the, the task or generator type that also provides the promise type. It's usually an embedded type, or uh, you can have a, a, a using statement, um, <coughs> using alias, sorry, to an external type. But it's, it's usually associated with the task type. But the instance is held within the coroutine frame and is accessed via the coroutine handle. So we will see this in practice, but I want to walk you through it from a high level first. OK, now, there's one other type we need to provide on the user-provided side. And that's what we call the awaiter. You can actually write coroutines without an awaiter, or at least without a custom awaiter. As we see, there are some standard library provided ones. Uh, but for most... Um, non-trivial coroutines, you will write your own awaiter. And an awaiter is, 
it's another case where you're providing methods that the infrastructure of the coroutines are going to call, that the magic of coroutines is going to call back to your awaiter. Uh, there's only three methods in this one. We'll see them in a moment. Um, but they're, they're quite important. And it will typically have access to the coroutine handle at different points as well. Now, I, I mentioned that there are some standard library provided awaiters. Uh, they, they may not look like awaiters, but they are. One of the methods on a waiter is, um, are you ready? Which you can translate as, should I suspend or not? Because if, if you're, you are ready, then you don't need to be suspended. So there's two library types, which are what we call trivially awaitable types. They're just awaiters that simply say, suspend always or suspend never. And there's not really much else to them. But because they are well-known types, you should use these because the compiler can see them and say, ah, yeah, I know now at compile time, this coroutine always suspends at this point or never suspends at this point. And we'll, we'll look at that a bit more in a moment. Two more types, which I'm not really going to talk about um, at all, really. Slightly more advanced. Stood coroutine traits and no op coroutine promise. Just put it up there for completeness. I'll only say about stood coroutine traits. This is where you can customize how some things get, get mapped. Uh, we, we might mention that in a bit, but don't worry too much about it. Let's just dig into the user-provided types a little bit more, starting with the task type or generator type. As I say, it has it, it, its responsibility is to provide the promise type. Usually, as an embedded type, which is what we're going to use, and most examples you'll look at, we'll, we'll do it this way. There's a couple of other ways to do it as well, but not the instance, as I say. What it does also usually hold is the coroutine handle, and it manages its lifetime. So that, that's up to you. So looking into the promise type. Now, this is where you can suddenly be overwhelmed by lots of methods, but they're actually fairly simple. So first of all, we have, we have these four. Get return object. It's almost always the same implementation. So if you don't remember exactly how to write get return object, just copy from another example. It's probably right. Uh, it's really the thing that um, creates the task or generator type from a, a promise. If you remember the promise, the instance of the promise type is in the coroutine frame. That's been created for you by magic. It's already alive there. And the, a method is called on it, get return object, that's got to return our task or generator type. And remember, the task or generator type usually wants to have a coroutine handle, okay. which is interesting because, well, I've got a promise. I need a handle. There's a method to get between the two. We'll, we'll see that later. You put those thing, things together, and you get this um, implementation that's almost exactly the same everywhere, uh, unless you really need to, to customize it. So don't worry too much about it. Definitely something crying out for uh, a library uh, support. The next two, initial suspend and final suspend, um, just answers the questions of, should I suspend um, at the start of a coroutine or not? or have a bit of code that runs as soon as you call it. And similarly, at the end, should the coroutine finish in a suspended state or just immediately be destroyed? Now, with the first one, it depends entirely on your use case. Do you have code that it makes sense to run before you get to the first suspension point or not? Simple as that. With final suspend, unless you know otherwise, always call uh, suspend always. Always return suspend always. Because otherwise, the task can't actually clean it up. There is a way for the coroutine itself to effectively clean itself up, uh, which can be useful if, you're having, if you've got multi threaded coroutines. We're not going to talk about that today. Um, <clears throat> this will make a little bit more sense when we see the code, but trying to give you a heads up. 
and then return value or return void, one or the other. And this is just a function that gets called, a method that gets called when you hit co-return or drop off the end of the co-routing. So in a normal function, you have a return keyword, you can return a value. Because it's a co-routine and you have the co-return keyword, that calls a function instead, or a method. It's one of these two. So obviously, if there's no value to co-return, it calls return void. Otherwise, it calls return value. Pretty simple. There's no um, like hard interfaces for these as well, I should say. It's not like you're inheriting from some virtual interface that it has to conform to exactly this. So if you want to use different value categories for these types, you can. Uh, it's, or even have it as a template that could be deduced. It all just works. Now you can see there's a bit of a space at the bottom. That there's two more that I want to bring up. They're both optional in different ways, which is why I didn't put them up first. The first four you have to provide. Uh, obviously, return value or return void is one or the other. But you have to provide th those first four. Yield value, you prov only provide if your coroutine has the co underscore yield statement in it. And if it does, then in the same way that co return calls return value or return void, co yield will end up calling uh, yield value. Exactly the same way. You pass it the, the object that you're co yielding. Except that co yield then will usually suspend the, the co routine as well. In fact, it returns an awaiter so you can decide whether it does or not. But otherwise, it's much the same as co return. And then unhandled exception, well, if an exception is thrown during the running of the coroutine that's not caught within the coroutine itself, then unhandled exception is called with, I believe, the exception pointer. Almost every single um, demo or example code that I've seen just does to terminate there. <laughs> and I I'm following that tradition. <laughs> but if you want to do more custom error handling, then that that's the place you'd do it. OK. So that's the promise type. That's the big one. Uh, so it looks overwhelming when you see that all at once. But actually, when you break it down, there's not that much to it. A waiter is a bit simpler. It's just these three methods. Await ready, await suspend, await resume. I already talked about await ready. I just didn't name it. That just returns a Boolean to say, is the thing you're waiting for ready or not? before suspending. So if it is, you don't need to suspend. And that's the thing that the trivially awaitable types will, will differ on. Await suspend is called just before a coroutine is suspended, with the handle of the coroutine that's being suspended, which means within there you can get access to the promise of the coroutine being suspended. And that can be useful to either get or, or put state into the promise type. Remember I said, because the promise type is in the coroutine frame, it's in this stable block of memory for the duration of the coroutine, and that's how you can interact with it, including at the point of suspension. And await resume is called, again, by the magic of the coroutines, just before a coroutine is resumed. So if you've got a coroutine handle, and you say dot resume on it, we saw that earlier, or we talked about it, it will first call await resume, and then resume the, the co-routing. Uh, now, we're not going to talk about it today, but there is a way to get it to resume a different co-routing, which allows you to transfer control between co-routings without going all the way back again. Um, you could think of it as a performance optimization, so we won't talk about it today. OK. Then I think I need to go back to the code. Look at how this works in practice. So this is our build task. So we had a build task before. So it plays basically the same role. But now there's a bit more to it. You can see we've got the promise type in there. So I've gone with the embedded struct option. It's the most common option. If you control the build task, why not just put it in there? Nice and convenient. If you don't want to put it in there, you can have an external type 
And in here, you just have a, a using promise type equals whatever you have outside. The third way, I think you can use the coroutine traits to say for this particular type build uh, task type, this is the promise type. So there's three ways you can do it. But this is the common way. Um, and here, we have our methods that are called by the coroutine magic, the ones we just walked through. So get return object. Remember I said they almost always have the same implementation, obviously with different type names in there. But we want to produce a build task. And we want to give it a handle, which you can see down here is, the, is an alias for coroutine handle. That has a static method from promise. And we are on promise. So we pass ourselves in. We get back the coroutine handle. We can construct the build task and return it. Pretty straightforward. It might seem an odd choice to make you go through those hoops. Surely this could be done automatically. But it does give you some customization points. Uh, you may want to do something different here. You don't always need the coroutine handle. Usually you do. So if in doubt, just copy this from somewhere else. Initial suspend, final suspend. We'll usually use these trivially awaitable types. Suspend never and suspend always. As I say, final suspend will almost always be suspend always, so that you can clean up. In this case, um, we don't want to initially suspend, because we actually have some work that we can do before we need to await our dependencies. In other cases, you may want to wait um, before doing anything at all. That gives you the control. And because all we're doing here is returning an awaiter, if we need to determine something at runtime to make that choice, we can do that as well. But usually we'll use these. Um, when we get to a co-return, which in our case is going to be the object that we are producing, it calls return value. So here, I'm passing an F object pointer by our value reference. As I say, we, it's up to us what value category we, we want to do here. And I'm just moving that into our internal state member. So we're holding on to it in a place that we can get to later. Um, and then I, I lied. <laughs> there was one other <laughs> method that we can have on the promise type that I didn't talk about before. Because you don't usually see it, actually, uh, certainly in these um, examples. Await transform. Um, when we do await, co-await something, there's, again, three ways that we can get an awaiter from something else. One of them is to provide a wait transform. So in this case, we want to await dependencies. So if you do co-await dependencies, it will call a wait transform, and this is going to return our dependency awaiter. Now, if you control the object being awaited, you can either give that the awaiter interface itself, or we'll give it a method that returns an awaiter. And that's more common um, instead of await transform. But the reason I've done it this way, if I go into that, is because it gives us this point where we can immediately store those dependencies in the promise type before creating the, the awaiter. And then finally, unhandled exception, we're just terminating here. So they're the moving parts. We also have this state. We already saw the object. So when we co-return the object, it's going to end up here in the promise type. Later, we can ask the task object for the object. And it can call via the handle to the promise and get the object. We'll see that in action. And these dependencies. We just saw that when we call await transform, we're storing the dependencies up here. And notice it's a stood span of dependencies. In our dependency object, if we look in there, uh, here, you can see we have a vector of dependencies. 
the reason we can hold a span of dependencies is because that dependencies object lives in the coroutine frame. Remember, all of the local variables of a coroutine are instantiated on the coroutine frame. So it's still going to be alive when we suspend and resume. So it's actually safe to have spans or views, references, that even that span suspension points in our promise type. Now I wanted to highlight that because with the, the Lambda-based version that we saw previously, uh, we couldn't do that. Remember, that was why we had to create that shared pointer to a shared pointer. And we'll see how that cleans that, that bit up in a moment. Because we needed some block of memory that was going to be stable between those calls. So this is an improvement. Um, and we have the ID. That's mostly for tracking purposes. So I've added this convenience function method here to get the promise type, because we, we tend to do that a lot. All it does is just call handle.promise. Given a handle, you can get to the promise type. That's how you do it. Um, but you'll actually see that I go via this promise method instead. Lifetime management. I said that we as a task are responsible for managing the lifetime of the coroutine the whole coroutine frame and everything in it via the coroutine handle. So in a destructor, I'm calling destroy coroutine, which calls handle.destroy. Simple as that, really. You could have some sort of um, RAI wrapper for the handle, maybe even give it move semantics. Um, it's, it's usually not worth it because you don't usually want to have copies or even move around your task objects. So just calling dot destroy in a destructor is usually all you need to do. But you can do that. And most of the rest of it is just getters and setters, really. And then we've got this resume method. So remember I said the build tar or the task object or the generator object is like a remote control for the coroutine. It's our interface as users of it, of how we interact with it. So we've got a method dot resume. If we have a look in there, it ultimately just calls resume on the handle. I can't seem to highlight that for some reason. There we go. So that will resume the coroutine. But we can also do a little bit extra. We can check whether it was already done. Um, and if it is done, we can get the object out and return that. So we've got a slightly different interface. Because it's our interface, we can do what we like here. How we present the coroutine to the outside world is up to us. So I've now shown you all of the build task and the promise type, which is actually most of the, the coroutine. The only bit that I didn't really, I uh, did show you the awaiter as well. So I think we're there. One other thing to mention while we're here, you notice here we've got coroutine handle with empty angle brackets. Later, we've got coroutine handle with promise type. So the empty angle brackets is a specialization of the coroutine handle template, which basically implements a type erased version. So if you don't know or care what the promise type is, you don't need to get to it then you could just use this. It's nice and convenient. So all that really remains is to show what that actually buys us. Let's go straight to the more complex one. So the builder for fixed rate bond forward with its dependencies now. This part all looks the same. We're building up. Our dependencies, but then we just call co await dependencies. And now we know what happens when you do that. That's going to call await transform on the promise type, which will store the dependencies in the promise type and return our dependency awaiter, which is only really used by the, the coroutine machinery. 
That will suspend the coroutine, return control back to the top level caller, where we can, we can carry on. And later, we can do dot resume on the task, which will dot resume on the coroutine handle, which will go, we'll call resume on the awaiter, sorry, uh, await resume on the awaiter, and then resume the, the coroutine, and come back to here. Straightforward enough. And ultimately, now we've got the object, it's fully built, we can co-return it, which we'll call uh, return value on the promise type. We store the object in the promise type, and later we can ask for it via the build task, which gets it from the promise type and returns it. So hopefully you can see how that's all fitting together. There seem to be extra hops involved. <laughs> And it seems very unnecessary to begin with. But it all starts to make sense and very quickly becomes second nature. So believe me, if, if it does seem a little bit much, pers do persist. Now, what I want to highlight here is compared to the previous version where we had the lambdas, not only is this less syntactic noise, but there are some fundamental differences. Rather than having a continuation lambda, this is all in the same body of code, and all of the uh, local variables are just still there, sitting there, in the coroutine frame, accessible and stable. That makes particular, a particular difference in the case of build curve. Up front, we just have a shared pointer to a curve. We express that as a dependency, car weight our dependencies co-return the curve. It's a lot simpler. Because now we don't have to do that dance and the extra heap allocation to, to hold on to that block of memory between these calls. So this is it's not just syntax. It's not just syntactic sugar over the what you could do with lambdas. There are very real differences here that are valuable. Um, Two other things I wanted to show you, if I can find them. They're both here, actually. First of all, I thought I was going to forget this. I did last time, so I, I wrote it in as a comment. <laughs> our deserialize, our batch deserialize function, deserialize all. In this version, we are taking our strings, our IDs, as a vector by value. Now, I actually caught myself out when I was going over this code again, ready for today, doing a bit of refactoring. I came across this and, oh, why am I taking a vector by value? If I change it to constref. In fact, let's do that now and see what happens. This is definitely worth emphasizing. Got a JSON exception. Why would I get a JSON exception? Well, this is a coroutine. I didn't show you this one, but because it's a coroutine, if we pass the argument in by by reference, the finger passing in may not still be around when the coroutine is resumed, and we are using those IDs after we've got a co-yield here. So it's a dangling reference. But it's a really subtle one to spot. So I'll put that back. We usually consider it a, an error or a bug to take anything by, by reference to a co-routine. But there are some cases where you can do it, but you've got to be really, really careful. And in fact, I had wanted to show you, but for some reason it's not kicking in now. That, oh, because I just took it out. Let's put that back, sorry. Ooh. And I think I'm running out of time. So let's hope this works. There we go. That might be a bit small to read, but it says 
Pass this parameter by a value that may be used after coroutine is suspended and may become dangling. So there, yeah, I have to put my sonar hat on and say, this is why you should use sonarlint. Because it catches things like this that are really hard to spot. But I think I'm going to have to cut that there. I wanted to show you this uh, generator because there's a lot of extra code here to make the, the final vector into a coroutine instead. In C++26, we've got std generator, which will basically just replace all of that. Uh, you just include std generator, return std um, generator of build task, and you're done. But I'm going to have to quickly go back to my recap slide. Skip over that. And wrap up by saying that was it. I wanted to do a little bit more, but we ran out of time there. And make a, a promise <laughs> that I will have the, all the references from this talk, um, including all the code, on my site, levelofindirection.com slash refs slash coroutines.html. It's not there right now. And I did say this the last time I gave it as well, and I forgot to put it up there, so I will put it in <laughs> this afternoon, I promise. <laughs> but that is coroutines from scratch, so thank you very much.